Good morning. Welcome to the church at Heathrow. Thank you for choosing to work in, uh, worship with us this morning. I think I switched work and worship last time I did this. I, they're not the same. Uh, so uh, the Hodges are out sick this morning, so Greg is uh, graciously going to fill the pulpit for us. Uh, you can keep the Hodges in prayer uh, for quick recovery and for no further infection. Um, I have one announcement this morning. Uh, we are going to start our small group sign up, uh, which is something that we're rolling out for the, the whole church, for anyone who wants to. And for right now, we're going to have two groups that are going to meet on, uh, mine's going to meet on Mondays. The Hodges, uh, I don't think, have it nailed down yet. But we're going to start this uh, October 3rd. And what we're going to do is a book study. Um, this is a nine marks book on conversion is the topic that we're going to study. So uh, it's, we, we've been doing it for uh, about two years at our house with the Youngs and, and William, and it's just a wonderful time to pray together and get to know the people that you go to church with, and also to get into the Word a little bit and learn about um, different topics that are essential for spiritual formation. So that's the plan. Uh, out in the lobby, when you leave church this morning, there'll be two sign-up sheets, one for the Hodges, which is the Lake Mary group, and then one for uh, the Mans, which uh, we're down in Orlando. So depending on where you live, we're trying to spread it out a little bit and uh, be in your proximity. So if you are interested in attending, um, you just jot down your name and your email, your phone number, and we'll reach out, get in contact with you. Or if you want information, uh, you can speak to me or Greg or William. Um, and I think that's it. That's all the announcements I have. So uh, William is going to come up and... Lead us in corporate prayer. Thank you, Josh. I highly, highly recommend what Josh was just talking about. It's a great, great activity. Our call to worship is taken from Psalm 36, verses 5 through 10. Psalm 36 has a couple of distinctions. The first one is it's called, from David, the servant of the Lord. And that's the only time that's used in all of his psalms except for Psalm 18. It's an unusual thing. The second is that Paul quotes Psalm 36 in the summation of his there is none righteous, no, not one uh, paragraph in Romans 3, that being there is no fear of God before their eyes. Psalm 36, 5 through 10, hear the word of the Lord. Your loving kindness, O Lord, is in the heavens. Your faithfulness reaches to the clouds. Your righteousness is like the great mountains. Your judgments are a great deep. O Lord, you preserve man and beast. How precious is your loving kindness, O God. Therefore, the children of men put their trust under the shadow of your wings. They are abundantly satisfied with the fullness of your house, and you give them drink from the river of your pleasures. For with you is fountain, the fountain of life. In your light, we see light. O oh, continue your loving kindness to those who know you and your righteousness to the upright in heart. Let's pray. Father, we come to you this morning, gathered here as a congregation of your people, preparing to worship you, our Savior and our King. We thank you for your unfathomable loving kindness, which is your loyal, committed love, your faithfulness, mercy, and trustworthiness. Father, give us the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ, that the eyes of our understanding be enlightened, that we may catch even a glimpse more of your loving kindness by the hymns we sing and by the preaching of your word that we're about to hear, that we may know what is the hope of his calling, what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints? And what is the exceeding greatness of his power toward us who believe, according to the working of his mighty power, which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all principality and power and might and dominion, and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in that which is to come. And he put all things under his feet and gave him to be head over all things to the church, which is his body, 
the fullness of him who fills all in all. Father, we regret in the many ways which we find life outside of yourself. Our selfish hearts deceive us into being self-sufficient and yearning for the idols of our imagination. It is a good day when you give us a glimpse of ourselves, broken reeds, empty cisterns, fading flowers, and withering grass. You alone are the ancient of days, the rock of ages. Grant that, may, that we might walk as Christ walked, live in the newness of life, the life of loving kindness, the life of faith, the life of holiness. Father, give us a deeper repentance, a deeper trust, a deeper faith, a deeper knowledge of you. Give us deeper holiness in speech, thought, and actions. We have no delight but you. We are nothing but what you make us. We have nothing but what we receive from you. We can be nothing but what grace produces. Dig us deep, O Father, and then fill us to overflowing with living water. Amen. We come this morning uh, needy people. We need our Savior, and it is so sweet to trust in Jesus. And that's what we are going to sing about this morning as we stand and worship. It is so sweet to trust in Jesus. It is so sweet. It is so sweet to trust in Jesus. Just to take him at his word. Just to trusted because he has the everlasting arms that we can lean on. Let's sing that right now. Leaning on the everlasting arms.
What a fellowship. What a fellowship. What a joy divine. Leaning on the everlasting arms. What a blessedness. What a peace is mine. church. How are you guys doing today? I'm glad to be here. I'm glad that you're here. I'm glad that you've come to to worship with us today Um, as uh, Josh and I'm sure as you've obviously figured out at this point Ward is not here. He's not feeling very well. Uh, Him and the Hodges family are are ill today but uh, they're okay but just a little ill too ill to be here um, he wants to be here, um, and I know that he's praying for you as you're here today, so please pray for them today. Our reading today, we will not be in John today. Uh, we will be in the book of Genesis today. I'll be reading from the ESV, but our reading today will be from Genesis 1. We will begin in verse 26, and we'll read through uh, verse 8 in chapter 2. Uh, so hear the word of the Lord today. It says, then God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image, in the image of God, he created him, male and female, he created them. And God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the earth and subdue it, and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth. And God said, Behold, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is on the face of all the earth, and every tree with seed and its fruit, you shall have them for food. And to every beast of the earth, and to every bird of the heavens, and to everything that creeps on the earth, everything that has the breath of life, I have given every green plant for food. And it was so. And God saw everything that he had made, and behold, it was very good. And there was evening, and there was morning, the sixth day. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the host of them. And on the seventh day, God finished his work that he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work that he had done. So God blessed the seventh day and made it holy, 
because on it God rested from all his work that he had done in creation. These are the generations of the heavens and the earth when they were created. In the day that the Lord God made the earth and the heavens, when no bush of the field was yet in the land and no small plant of the field had yet sprung up, for the Lord God had not caused it to rain on the land, and there was no man to work the ground. And a mist was going up from the land and was watering the whole face of the ground. Then the Lord God formed the man of dust from the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living creature. And the Lord God planted a garden in Eden in the east, and there he put the man whom he had formed. The word of the Lord. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, these are such meaningful words, so much we can learn from this, God. I, I pray that you would help us to, to do that today, that you would help us to learn more about you, help us to, to gain some understanding into this mystery of what it means to be a human, what it means that we were made in your image as we seek to know you better, to know ourselves better, to know this world that we live in better. Help us to do that today, God. Help us to think about you and to be amazed by you, for you are a great God. There is none like you. Help us to understand this mystery today. Lord, please be pleased with us today as we seek to honor you today. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand and we'll keep singing. next song highlights um, the first line is I approach the throne of glory nothing in my hands I bring the simplicity that we get to come to the Lord and worship because solely of his grace shed on us that's why we're here this morning we contribute nothing to our salvation but the sin that makes it necessary that's our, actually a quote from Jonathan Edwards but how gracious is our God. And they see that he's invited us to be a people who were once not a people, to proclaim his excellencies, Peter says, who brought us out of darkness and into his marvelous light in Christ. It's a simple, we have simple worship. Let's simply come to him this morning, admit our need for him, and sing to him because of his grace that he shed on us because he's a good and gracious king.
Lord, unto 
This morning, we're reminded that we can trust you. We're reminded, Lord, that it's sweet to trust in you, Jesus. And Lord, that's a privilege because you've called us to yourself. You've brought us into fellowship with you, God. What a sweet reminder it is that we can just lay our burdens on you. And we don't have to carry them on our own. You always promise to be with us and not to forsake us. And Lord, for what? Because we don't have anything to bring to the table, Lord. When it comes to pleasing you, all we have is our sin. But Lord, you still accept us. That promise of acceptance is there for us who believe and trust in Christ. And so, Lord, thank you for your faithfulness to us. Because, Lord, you don't just bring us in only to kick us out later for poor performance as a Christian. No, Lord, you sustain us and you build us up in grace. You build us up in the Holy Spirit. And we ask that you do that more and more, which is why we come back to you week after week after week, day after day, because we need your help. We need your help now as you bring us your word. Be with Greg as he brings this message. And may you be high and lifted up in this place. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. What a truth that that is. I asked you just a few minutes ago, I stood up here and I said, how are you guys doing today? And I, I did that with some intention. My brother and my friend William back here said, great. And I'm glad that he's doing great. But my thinking is, not everybody in this room would answer the same way. Life is hard. You're dealing with lots of things. There are stresses. There are difficulties. Um, I do not have the ability to take those away from you, but I know the one who does. Uh, great is his faithfulness. I uh, encourage you this morning, church, to remember that truth. And bring them to the cross. You know, we have this here for a reason. It should be a constant reminder of many things. 
but none other than the life that we have because of it and the goodness of the God who sent his son to die for us. So be encouraged this morning. That has absolutely nothing to do with the text that we're going to read this morning, but I just was thinking about that back there as we were singing that song. Um, I must admit to you, um, we might be at a little bit of a disadvantage because the text that we're uh, in today um, is the sermon that I will be preaching at the Children's Ranch today. We've been in Genesis 1 at our service at the ranch on Sundays. I want to invite you, if you ever want to come and be a part of that, I know sometimes we might think that that's uh, only for the ranch because of the the type of uh, a place that that is, being a, a children's home, but I want you to know that you are invited to come and join with us. You have not only my permission, but the permission of the leadership there that you can come and join. We meet every Sunday uh, at 2 o'clock, and I want to invite you to come meet some of the most wonderful people that I know, besides yourselves, of course. Um, but we've been in Genesis 1 now for about uh, five weeks over there, and we have been seeking to understand ourselves. Um, that seems to be the, the mantra of this world, right? Who am I? What am I doing here? How did I get here? These questions, there's thousands of books written on it. You certainly are no short of typing into YouTube that question, and you could probably spend the rest of your natural life reading article after article answering that, but we want to know the truth about who we are. And so we've asked ourselves three questions. Who is God? I think it's fair to say, I know it's right to say, to answer the second question of who am I, we must first answer who is God. You cannot understand yourself without an understanding of God. I, as I'm sure everyone here believes, would confidently tell you there is a God. You were created by that God. Uh, we've spent the last four or five weeks dispelling the myths and the inaccuracies of evolution and things of that nature, and we've come now to this point in our text of Genesis 1.26 as we're seeking to understand ourselves. Who am I? Maybe you ask those questions to yourself. Martin Luther, the great reformer, once said, and I quote, if he could understand the first two words of the Lord's Prayer as Christ did, the rest of his life in Christ would fall into place. Luther's humble yet very accurate observation shows us that it is, it's easy to use God's Word, but it's much more difficult to grasp the reality that they signify, that they mean. Our Father... We say those quite often as the beginning to a prayer, but yet there is great depth and meaning in those two words. And just like the words, our Father, so it is with the words, image of God. Many have heard them uh, and of its concept, but few believers grasp the, the profound significance that it means. Um, quite simply, let me tell you before we be really begin, the image of God, those three words, the image of God, is the basis, the foundation for our dignity as humans, both in our existence and our purpose. So if that's true, what does it mean then? What does it mean... When, we, when the Bible tells us that we were made in the image of God, are we to understand it literally? Like, is God just a whole lot bigger than us? Uh, does he have a six million size waist and a one million size shoe? Do we look like him? It sounds silly when I say that. You think, okay, come on, we're being a little silly here, right? And it does sound silly. Although I would tell you there are those who would answer that question, yes. Uh, the Mormons, specifically, um, and we might more refer to them as the Latter-day Saints, LDS. Uh, this is what they teach, and this is a direct quote from their book, The Doctrine and Covenants, 
This is section 130, line 22. This is what they teach their, their people. And I quote, the father has a body of flesh and bones as tangible as man's, the son also. That's what they teach. And they've interpreted the phrase after our likeness to also mean, um, and I use the word also because I do want to tell you they do not deny the spiritual implication of it, but they, they say that it also means our physical bodies are a direct reflection of God's physical nature. And they would point to phrases in the Bible such as the hand of God, the eyes of God, the face of God. But I want to tell you very clearly, this is an inaccurate interpretation of Scripture. This is not right. The word that we need to learn, if you're not familiar with it, it's a big word. It's called anthropomorphism. Anthropomorphism. Uh, anthropomorphism is a Greek word. It's a style of writing, and it comes from two words. Uh, it comes from the word uh, anthropos, which means man, and it comes from uh, the other word is morph, which means form. Anthropomorphism is a style of writing where the writer uh, is using words or phrases to describe God, to describe a divine being, in a way that is understandable and relatable to the reader by using physical features that we possess and that we understand. Does that make sense? So in order to help us understand and relate to the God of the Bible, the writer uses features that we have, hands, feet, eyes, face, because we can understand that. It helps us to understand and relate. Um, let me give you just a few examples. I'll give you just three. Uh, there are certainly many. Uh, Psalm 5.5 5 says, The boastful shall not stand before your eyes. Psalm 89.10, You scattered your enemies with your mighty arm. You will be very familiar, I'm sure, with the next one, number 625. You've heard it in many closing prayers. In fact, it's always our closing prayer after communion, which we'll have next week. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. Now, there are a lot of verses like this in Scripture, but they're written in such a way to help us understand the spiritual nature and character of God by using physical attributes that we possess. That's anthropomorphism. We got that? Clearly, this is what God says. Jesus, speaking to the woman at the well, says it very simply in John 4, 24, God is spirit. That's what it says, right? That's pretty clear. God is spirit. Three words, God is spirit. But now the Mormon or those who would believe what they say or teach what they say, here's what they would say, that just because the Bible says that God is spirit does not outlaw the possibility that he also has a body. Meaning just because it says this doesn't mean it doesn't mean this. And at first, there could potentially be some argument to that because we would say the same thing to somebody who would try to convince us that we had free will within our salvation because this verse over here says this. But what we would then do is we would say, well, before we get to that, we need to look at the context within that verse. We need to look at the surrounding verses. We need to look at the situation. We need to look at it in comparison with the rest of Scripture, would we not? When we come to understand our theology and the things that we believe about God, we want to look at the whole of Scripture. That's why at this church we aim to teach the whole counsel of God. Because there are verses that we've just seen them, they talk about eyes and they talk about ears. Uh, many, many, many times, if you're here on Wednesday nights as we're going through Psalms, we hear, incline your ear to me. So we hear these things. And not to mention in Genesis 2-7, this is what Genesis 2-7 says, God formed the man, or God formed man of the dust from the ground, and breathed into his nostrils, and he became a living creature. So we see man, we see us, a living spirit with a physical body. So some might say that God is 
not just a spirit because you say so out of John 4, 24. But the, the, the issue with that and why we know and believe God to be spirit is because the context of this conversation, the context of this conversation between Jesus and the woman, the whole issue is a question of geography. It's a geographical uh, type of question. Let me show you. Verse 20 says, our fathers worshiped on this mountain. So she's, she's pointing to a specific place. Our people worship over here, but you say that over here in Jerusalem is the place where people ought to worship. You see the difference? We're pointing to different places, this place over here, this place over there. There's a geographical problem. The question is, our people worship here, the Jews worship over here. Where am I supposed to go to worship? Where is God? That's the question, really. Where is God, Jesus? To which Jesus responds in the next verse, verse 21. Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. Verse 24, God is spirit. God is spirit. Those who worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. The whole point of Jesus' answer here is that God cannot be restricted to one place. God cannot be... uh, restricted to a location. God is not restricted to a building, church. We are not the only church that God resides in. God is throughout the world and in many churches this morning, and we need to be praying for those churches this morning that God would be lifted up and would be worshiped. But the reason why God can't be restricted is because he's a spirit. He's a spirit. The the, the scriptures clearly and plainly declare this. The problem is, what's a spirit? That's really the problem. The problem is, what is a spirit? Many are just as puzzled as Nicodemus was just a chapter earlier uh, when Jesus was talking to him about spiritual birth. Uh, This great theologian, the the teacher of Israel, as he is referred to in Scripture, is scratching his head and he's asking the question, like, how can this be? How how can I, I've already been born, uh, how do I, do I have to go back in my mother's womb? I mean, that seems like a pretty terrible experience. Uh, I don't know how that's going to work. How do I put this together? Uh, He's clearly, uh, his mind is frazzled just as you and I would be if we were standing there in that moment hearing these words from Jesus. But this is what Jesus says to him in John 3, 8. He says it's like the wind. The wind blows where it wishes. You hear its sound, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who was born of the Spirit. So how do we conceive Spirit? How did the Jews conceive Spirit? It seems as if the idea idea of Spirit is like a a gaseous type of matter. Like uh, the Spirit is sort of like a cloud or a vapor. Uh, We read Genesis 1-2, the the Spirit was hovering over the face of the waters. And if you're like me, my mind thinks about this this substance that's floating across a lake, you know, like this mist that we see. Or, you know, we pray prayers, you know, Holy Spirit, fill this place. And so our mind thinks that He's got to come from here to here. Or, you know, when we read that the Spirit entered the room and and we, and we hear these things, our minds start to go to the Spirit or God as some type of matter, uh, even though it may not be the same kind of intensity that a solid piece of material has. Nevertheless, it's still some form of matter. But we have to understand, church, that when the Bible speaks about God being a Spirit, that what the Bible is saying is God is not matter. He's not gaseous matter, he's not liquid matter, he's not solid matter, he's not a a composite being made up of several parts added together. God is not matter. This goes beyond, this transcends our ability to understand because, let's face it, we don't have any real reference point for a spirit being. Everything you and I know to be real, whether by sight or by touch, is made up of some form of matter. But when we 
um, in our minds limit God to some type of matter, we then limit God to the boundaries of that matter. And God has no boundaries. God has no limits. And if you're like me, you get to a point where your brain goes, and you can't take it anymore because you can't get there. It's like understanding eternality, never has always been. Well, my mind doesn't go that far. But that doesn't change the truth about God. We, we write in certain ways to help us understand God, but we must be careful that we don't take those things and try to change God to fit into something that we can understand. The Bible says that the mysteries of God belong to God. There are things about God that you and I will never understand. I heard somebody tell me one time a few years back, man, whoever, whoever made God did a great job. And I thought to myself, I, I, I understood for a moment what this individual was trying to say, but I had to stop and catch myself, and I had to say, whoa, this is not good. This is wrong thinking. God did not originate somewhere in some time. God has always been. And just because you and I can't grasp that does not change the reality of God. Amen? Amen? Amen. So when the Bible says in Genesis 1.27, which it so clearly says, that God made man in his own image, in the image of God he created him, male and female he created them, it is not referring to a physical aspect, but to the spiritual nature of God. Now, we must also be careful here. This does not mean we are like God in all ways. We resemble God, but we are not God. You are not the God of your world. You might pretend to be, but you're not God. Men, we pretend to be the gods of our homes. That is until our wives enter the room, but we are not God. We are not little gods either. This new thing about us being little gods. We are not little gods. We are patterned after him, but we are at the same time greatly, greatly, and this word greatly does not do justice, greatly inferior to him. We are certainly like him in some ways, like God we speak. We have language. Animals do not communicate with each other. Science will tell you this. They make noises. But dog doesn't speak cat. Cat doesn't speak porcupine. They don't tell each other about each other's days. They're not passing notes back and forth in class. I'm going to save that for my 10-year-olds later at 2 o'clock today. <laughs> but we can communicate with each other in both word and writing. We have the ability to learn and create new languages. I can learn Spanish. I've tried. I'm not very good at it, but I can. If I work hard enough. I can learn to read and write in a new language. There are many people in this room who are, they speak multiple languages. Nobody else on earth can do that. Or nothing else, excuse me. Let me clarify that. This speaks to the, the mental likeness that we have with God. We have the ability to think. We can reason, we can choose. A dog doesn't walk up to a sidewalk and look both ways to see if the car's coming. But we do, if we're taught right. Like God, we are moral. We know the difference between right and wrong. We have a, a sense of morality when we see somebody judge something well. That is a direct reflection of God. When somebody stops and does something right, that's a direct reflection of the morality of God. And on a side note, it is also one of the strongest arguments against atheism in evolution because morality, morals, can only come from a moral being. Morals don't come from dust, particles, or rocks. The fact that you have this innate understanding of right and wrong speaks to the very fact that you were created by a moral being. 
So we are like God in certain ways, mentally, morally, socially, but we are not completely like God. Like God, we exercise authority and dominion over lesser beings when we train an animal to obey us or to do something or we subdue something or some part of nature. We exercise that dominion that God has given us, but we are not like God in that we are under the dominion of God. God is under the dominion of no one. God clearly exercises his dominion, even in the very beginning in creation, in Genesis 2.16. God commanded the man. God exercising dominion, authority over his created beings. Humans were created. We mentioned this just a moment ago. We have an origin. We have a beginning point in time, even as a people, but God has always existed. It's, it's not coincidental that the very first attribute of God that the Bible tells us about is God's eternal nature. It's in the first four words of the Bible. Genesis 1.1, in the beginning, God, the, the comma is intentional. It's to help us to understand Moses is writing, in the beginning, Moses, in the beginning of time as you know it, in the beginning when everything began, God, I was. Before all of this began, I was already here. God has always been. God has no beginning. You and I certainly have a beginning, which means we also have an end. Humans are mortal. Have you had to attend a funeral lately? Humans are mortal. But God is eternal. God is not mortal. 1 Timothy 1.17 clearly says it. He's immortal. That's what it says, right? To the king of ages. Immortal. Invisible. The only God. Be honor and glory forever and ever. So clearly to be made in the image of God does not signify complete equality in nature with God. We don't want to misunderstand that. Simply put, to be made in the image or likeness of God is that we were made to resemble God. Um, it refers to the the immaterial part of humanity. Certainly, we have a physical nature. Genesis 2, 7, right? God formed man of the dust of the ground. We have a physical nature. But this is not the point. And it, it's, it's funny to me that the Bible spends one sentence, one verse, to tell us about our physical part, but a whole section on the spiritual part. It seems to me that God wants us to pay attention to what that means to the importance of what that is, because it's what sets us apart. It really does three things. It probably does more than this, but three most immediately. One, it sets us apart from the animal world. Uh, animals were not made in the image of God. They were made by God, to be sure, but they were not made in the image of God. Uh, the image of God fits us for dominion, our purpose. It fits us for the dominion that God intended for us to have over the earth. And it also does something for us that no other part of creation can do. It makes us able to commune with God, that we can have relationship and fellowship and, and time spent with God, our maker. But it doesn't just do this. It, I, I told you in the beginning that, that the image of God was the basis or the foundation for our dignity as humans, both in our existence and in our purpose. So it does not just speak to our resemblance of God, but it also speaks to our purpose in representing God. We, as representatives of God on earth, have a functional role to play. Now, I like how John Piper says it. You know, John Piper has this great ability to say something so deep and profound in the fewest of words. He, I don't have that gift. My buddy Will back there is timing me, and he's going to tell me exactly how long it took me to say these words. But John Piper says it in five words. I love it. 
This is what John Piper says when asked, what does it mean to be in the image of God? Here we go. Images are created to image. That's good. Images are created to image. Think about it. Why does anyone set up an image of anything? To image it. Uh, when Jesus, um, when the Pharisees tried to trick Jesus, by the way, that never works, tried to trick Jesus in asking him, well, is it lawful for us to pay Caesar? What did Jesus do? He says, hey, you got a quarter on you? You got, you got, you got a quarter? Let me, let me borrow that real quick. Whose what? Whose image is on this coin? Because when they said Caesar's, well, he's, well, that's Caesar's. That's Caesar's money. It's got his image on it. So give it to him. He owns it. It's his. Give to Caesar what is Caesar. Give to God what is God. You go to the, the Lincoln Memorial and you see a picture of Abraham Lincoln. What is that to do? It's to, so that you'll think about Lincoln and think about some quality or something great about Lincoln. So if God made us like any of the other animals unlike any of the other animals, excuse me, in his image, whatever this means in detail, and I'm not smart enough to break down all the details of that. There are hundreds of books if you want to spend the time understanding that, and it might be good to do that, but this is what it means clearly. Images are created to set forth the reality. God's the reality, and we're the image. God's the reality and we're the image. So that bodes the question, what does that mean? What does it mean? Why did God create man? Answer, to show God. To show God. Look, church, God created, if you, if you made seven billion statues of yourself and set them all across the world, why would you do that? So people would think about you. So people would see you and go, whoa, he must be real because there's a lot of him. God created a bunch of little images so that, now listen to me, I, I want to bring this down to an application so we can understand why is it important. What does this mean to me as a human being? What does this mean to me? God created little images so that they would talk and act and feel in a way that reveals the way God is. So that people would look at you, and now I want you to think you, like you, me. That people would look at you in the way that you behave, the way you think about things, the way you feel about things, and they would say, God must be great. God is real. That's why you exist. Everybody trying to figure out what their purpose is. That's it. That's your purpose. In everything that you do, that's why you exist, to image God. So we have to ask ourselves, here's the question. How are you doing in representing God? And if you're like me, the head starts to... What would your neighbors say? Your coworkers, your family, your friends, the people you... Go do whatever you do with. Does your life point to the greatness of God? Does your life speak to the joy that you have in God? We sang a song, the very first song. Nick, what was the name of that song? Um, it is so sweet to trust in Jesus. Love that song. Clearly not enough to remember the title, but I love that song. <laughs> no, I love that song. I have a terrible memory when it comes to music. But there's a line that says, aren't you glad that you learned to trust in him? Or you, aren't you glad that you learned to trust in him? Yeah. Aren't you glad? Amen. Are you glad, church? Yeah. 
Would your neighbors say that you're glad? Does the way you speak to people show the patience and kindness of God? Does it image the empathy and forgiveness of God? Does the way you treat money speak to your trustworthiness of the God that you serve? And you're trusting to provide in him, for him to provide for you. Does the way you work, men, women, for those of us that work, does the way you work image God and his work? Look, <coughs> I'm preparing this message for a week, and as I'm writing this, my head's... Because I got to tell you, I am not the greatest image bearer. I want to be. I really do. I want to be. But I'm just not the best image bearer. And yet, God has me standing in front of you today to tell you about him. What does that say about the magnus, just the magnificence and the beauty of God? Because here's the good news, church. This is what the Bible says, because here's the facts. When we don't image him well, that's called sin. And God is serious about sin. We live in a world, we don't take sin very seriously. We justify it, we make excuses for it, we belittle it, we downplay it. Sin is a big deal. And we need to take it seriously. When we fail to live up to our created purpose, we are sinning against our creator. But here's the, what God says in 1 John 1, 9. I love it. If we confess our sins. Now, I need to help you understand confess for just a quick second, and then we'll be done, I promise. Confess is more than just an acknowledgement. It's not just a, I acknowledge that that was wrong. There's a sense of repentance in this confession. There's an idea of, God, it's wrong, and I'm not going to do it anymore. Even though I know I'm going to end up screwing this thing up again. My mind is, I don't want to do it. Help me to stop doing it. I don't want to do it. God, I confess this is wrong. The way I've thought about this is wrong. The way I've done this is wrong. It is wrong because you say it's wrong, and you are the standard of living. You are the perfect one. And I am made to bear that image. Be holy as I am holy, he says. And if you'll do that, he's faithful. That's what we sang. Oh, great is thy faithfulness. He's faithful and he's just to forgive. You know why it's, it's just for him to forgive? Because he poured his wrath out on his son so that you don't have to take that wrath how amazing is that? When you think about your life, when I think about my life, I should have been nailed to the cross 27 times over. I should still be hanging there like the evil slob I am. But God did that for me. And so when we accept that, when we say, God, I'm trusting in you, I, your love for me is, is undeniable. I can't understand it. It overwhelms me. It doesn't make sense. But you say, if I'll come to you and I'll lay my sin at the foot of this cross, that you will take that sin from me and you will cleanse me and you will make me white as snow. Aren't you glad you trusted in Jesus? Amen. Church, we need to come before the Lord and we need to confess our sins before the Lord. And we need to ask God, to help us to be better image bearers. Amen? Amen? Let's go to the Lord. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for helping us. These things are hard. We, that you are not matter, that you are eternal, that you are immortal, that um, you've always been, and that you created us, and that you're perfect. And, and these things are overwhelming and mind-boggling to us, but they're true. So help us to, to understand them, to know them, to believe in them, and to trust them. Father, you've created us so that we might bear your image, that the world, that the earth, that everything that exists would look at Greg, would look at your people and say, God is good. God is great. God is real. 
let me know this God, let me worship this God. But the fact is, God, is we fail you so often. We are not good image bearers. And so we ask you to forgive us. Church, take with me for just a moment and confess your sin before the Lord. Father, thank you for your faithfulness. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for dying for us. Thank you for rising from the dead. You are not dead. You are alive. And you give life to all who come. For all who come. Father, I pray that if there's anyone in the sound of my voice right now that does not know you as Lord and Savior, that they would come to you. That you would give them faith to trust in what you say. That you might save them and forgive them of their sins and give them eternal life. That they might join the church in our praise of great is thy faithfulness. Conform us into the image of our Savior, God. Be patient with us. I pray that we would go forth today in this truth of who you are and how you created us and that we would boldly proclaim the good news. That we would not be afraid. That we would understand that we're not always going to have the right words. We're not always going to have the technical answer. But what we have is you. And you're enough that we can tell people, I once was lost, but now I'm found. I was an orphan, but now I have a family. I am a child of God, and I will always be a child of God. Thank you for your faithfulness, God. Thank you for this time and your word today. Lord, please bless us as we go. We love you. In Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand and sing as we close.
confess that with our hearts, Lord, that you are a good and gracious king, and you put us on this earth to reflect your image and your glory. What an awesome truth that is. Lord, we're thankful for the Savior who perfectly reflected your image in his life and in his death and his resurrection. Lord, may we seek to live like him, live like Jesus, to reflect your image each day this week. Give us the power and the strength to do that by your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name as we go. Amen. God bless you, church. Thank you.